Good morning. Welcome to our worship. Sunday, May the 23rd, the day of Pentecost. Let us light the Christ candle. We light the memorial candles today. We pray for everyone who has joined us this morning and watching and attending the service together this morning. May God's peace be with you all. Please join with me in the call to worship. The day of Pentecost is here. God's children have gathered in this place. We are transformed into God's family by God's Spirit joining with ours. Come, Spirit of adaptation, and open our hearts to our sisters and brothers. Come, Spirit of peace, and calm our trembling hearts. Come, breath of God, and overturn our conventional lives. Come, Holy Spirit. continue in the opening prayer. The gift of Jesus' life can be visible in the way we witness to the fruitfulness of that gift. The fruit of the Spirit consists of love, 
joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Yet so often we put conditions on our love and joy and peace are difficult to discern when our words and actions deny their presence. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit in me. Let us listen to the assurance of God's grace. Those who are in Christ are a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, with whom we have been reconciled through Christ. Thanks be to God. Miss Jane here. Happy Pentecost Sunday. Here we are. Can you believe it? Wow. Oh, Pentecost. What an amazing just time in our church year calendar where we come and we reflect and we celebrate and we just should be excited, right? Just excited about what it means, Pentecost, to embrace the Holy Spirit. That this is where, you know, God came and he gave us his truth through Jesus and he fulfilled it then with the Holy Spirit. Now, my young friends out there, it's a lot to grasp. I totally get it. So let's back up a little bit, shall we? In this moment of discovery time this morning, a couple key questions for you. Always have good questions for you, don't I? All right, question number one. When do you ever feel guilty about something? Yeah? Have you ever felt guilty about doing something or saying something? Anything. Guilt? 
Oh man, it can really get you sometimes, right? Where you feel bad about maybe saying something you shouldn't have or acting a certain way you shouldn't have, being asked to clean up your room, maybe lying about it. Oh my goodness. Well, we can feel guilty about a lot of things like taking an extra cookie when we shouldn't have. <laughs> Those kinds of things to feel guilty about, you know, aren't too bad. But when we get into things like lying and, and stealing, um, treating each other horribly, oh, when we even just think about some of the things that are happening in our world today and how people are treating each other, it does break your heart. Well, that's something I want you to hold on to. Hold on to guilt, what guilt means, because the Holy Spirit is going to help us with that. Can you believe it? Yep. So second question. All right. When we're understanding what we feel guilty about, what does your heart say? Hmm? Does your heart ever speak to you? Do you ever listen to your heart? Your heart actually talks a lot. Not just your brain, but your heart. Your heart actually talks. Well, this has to do again with the Holy Spirit. Because where does the Holy Spirit live? Lives in your heart, right? And the Holy Spirit talks to us each and every day. You know, for those of us who've said, God, I love you so much, and I love that you gave me Jesus, and I love now the Holy Spirit and want to accept that Holy Spirit in my life, then the Holy Spirit is going to talk to you loud and clear. But the question is, again, are you listening? Are you willing to listen to what the Holy Spirit is trying so hard to say? Well, that's a good question. How do we listen to the Holy Spirit in our everyday life? right? It's one thing to be celebrating Pentecost and welcoming the Holy Spirit, but now what? What do we do? Well, let's dig a little, little deeper, shall we? In a little bit more of the time that we have together for this discovery time. I've got a few things prepared here, so let me see if this will help guide us, okay? So there's five key words that can help us understand what the Holy Spirit does and how the Holy Spirit talks to us. Okay, one of the words, the Holy Spirit is a helper. Okay, the Holy Spirit, number two, is a convictor. Okay, think of the word conviction. The third, the Holy Spirit is a guide. Fourth, the Holy Spirit is a teacher. And fifth, the Holy Spirit is a changer. Now, let's take this in a little bit, shall we? Every day, the Holy Spirit will help you will help you in your relationship and your love and your understanding of what God wants from us. Now, for some of my awesome young friends out there, and you've got your Bible handy, all right. Can somebody look up for me Philippians chapter 2, verse 13? Philippians 2, chapter, chapter 2, verse 13, okay? That's going to help us with the helper part. Next. He will cause you to feel guilty when we sin, right? This is called conviction, convicting. The Holy Spirit convicting us when we know we have done something that has hurt God and that we need to talk to God about it because God, remember, his wonderful promise of forgiveness. All right, a couple other friends out there. Can you look up, please, um, John 16, 8. Okay, the book of John 16, 8. Another friend, 1 John 1, verse 9. Okay, awesome. So great. We've talked now about how the Holy Spirit can help us, how the Holy Spirit um, can convict, how we, how we understand conviction. And now he will guide you so your life will honor God. And the Holy Spirit does this as our guide by, you got it guys, reading and understanding the Bible and praying and talking to God, guiding us through prayer. Isn't that amazing? All right, somebody else, can you look up Romans 8, 14, please? All right, so now we're on to teaching, right? The Holy Spirit will teach us about God while we read the Bible, 
while we're in community at church, while we're listening to uh, Pastor Bright's message, while we're singing and praising songs, the Holy Spirit is the teacher by our side. Can somebody else look up John 14, 16? And last but not least, where we talk about the changer, the Holy Spirit can change us to be more like Jesus. You know, God not only forgives our sins, but he wants to fill our heart with good things. All right, last one, Galatians 5, 22 to 23. All right, in our last few seconds here at our moment of discovery. So what did all this good stuff tell us so we can understand how the Holy Spirit is our guide and our teacher and our convictor and our helper and our changer? Well, if you looked up Philippians 2, 13, then you found this, didn't you? For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do and to work accordingly to his good purpose. All right, what it says in John 16, 8. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. It's pretty powerful. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from the unrighteousness. Romans 8, 14. Did you get this one? For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. How cool is that? John 14, 16, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. So he tells us right about the Holy Spirit. And last but not least, the changer part. Galatians 5, 22, 23. But by the fruit of the Spirit is joy, peace, um, forgiveness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Oh my goodness. Friends, may the Holy Spirit be with you and live in you and shine in you. Listen to what the Holy Spirit wants to talk to you about your heart. Let that guilt go. Talk to God about it. Go in peace, everyone. The first reading is from John 15, verses 26 to 27. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of the truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You are also to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. Second reading is John 16, verses 4 to 15. But I have said these things to you so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you about them. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I'm going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer. About judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Hear what the spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. I heard about this airplane that was about to crash. There were four passengers, but only three parachutes. The first passenger says, I'm a leading heart surgeon. My patients need me. He took the first parachute and jumped. The second passenger says, I'm a rocket scientist, the smartest person ever in the world. My country needs me. He took the second parachute and jumped. The third passenger was Pope Francis. 
He says to the fourth passenger, the ten-year-old boy, Son, I'm old, I'm frail, I don't have a lot of time. Just go ahead and take the last parachute. But the ten-year-old boy said, Sir, don't worry about it. We still have two parachutes left. You see, the smartest guy in the world, he just jumped out with my backpack. Don't be the smartest guy in the world. The word, the Holy Spirit we're studying this morning actually comes from the Greek word, one Greek word that is paraclete or parakletos. From where we also get the word parachute. Paraclete or parakletos is translated as advocate, Comforter, counselor, or a helper. Speaking of a helper, I'd like to make an announcement today, which is the theme of my message today. We need all the help we can get more than ever, don't we? In Christian life, it is not hard necessarily, but it is impossible on our own. If you are saying that you are a believer, we are also admitting that we need help. We need God's help to be able to do this, don't we? The kind of helper the Holy Spirit is to us, the Bible promises, was the same kind of helper Jesus was to the disciples. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he says, I'm going to give you another helper, paraclete, paracletus, one just like Jesus Christ to the disciples. But it is still challenging to talk about, to identify who this helper is, this paraclete, paracletus. So when we have a problem, when a church has a problem and cannot answer to a question, what do we do? Yes, we form a committee. The church council met in year 325 AD in a place called Nicaea. And their, one, their answer was affirmed in writing the Nicene Creed. It came in a term called homoousius, meaning the same substance. The Nicene Creed declares Jesus is the same substance as God. Jesus is God. A while later, there was another gathering, and theologians like Gregory, Tertullian, Irenaeus, Augustine argued, so they formed another council in the year 381 AD in the place called Constantinople. And they amended the Nicene Creed by adding, the Holy Spirit has the same substance as God. Holy Spirit The Holy Spirit is God. The idea is that the Holy Spirit convinces people in the world that they are sinners, that they need help. And here is how it works. You know, before anyone can figure out they need help, they have to figure out that they have a problem. Unless we realize I'm in bad shape, I'm I'm in need of help, we'll never look for a helper or a savior. As long as we think I'm good enough, religious enough, holy enough, we'll never look for help. Jesus says, only those who are sick need a doctor. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, Jesus says. But most people in their natural thinking were not convinced that we need help. Some people cannot tolerate the idea that they need help or they are sinners. Sometimes I, I'm tempted to share some constructive criticism with Kim, trying to help my wife. 
I'm trying to give some good advice every once in a while. I say, if you had done my way, things would have been much, much better. No, I value my life. I don't do that. I don't say things like that. I only say to Kim, you did great there. You're amazing. When we try to convict people, it often turns out into, turns into condemnation. But the, Holy, the way Holy Spirit works is that Holy Spirit, according to Jesus, Holy Spirit drives a person down to the place where they see their deep need of a helper. So here is how it works. The Holy Spirit works in a place where we confess, where we admit, I need God's help. Not like this 13-year-old girl, Elizabeth. She was congratulated because she sold... Is there any Girl Scouts here? She sold 11,200 boxes of Girl Scout cookies. They asked how you did it. You know what she said? She said, you got to look people in the eye and make them feel guilty. The disciples on the day of Pentecost, they, they needed a helper. They needed somebody, they needed some presence so that they can be filled with that energy to be able to continue Jesus' ministry. On the day of Pentecost, Peter preached, Peter the disciple preached, and he says, 3,000 souls got saved. It's not because of how eloquent his sermon was, but it was the Holy Spirit, the Bible records, that convicted people, convicted 3,000 souls. On one occasion previously, Jesus was giving them a good example of how the Spirit works. It was the day of the Feast of Tabernacles, according to the Jewish Custom, the last day of the feast, temples packed full of people in John's Gospel, chapter 7. It's a standing room only, and Jesus was there. At certain ceremony, Jesus, because there were so many people, he lifted his voice. He had to yell because he didn't have any microphone or things like that. He had to say something like this. If anyone is thirsty, let them come to me and drink. Everybody stopped and looked at that guy. And Jesus says, anyone who believes in me, out of the heart will flow rivers of living water. Out of the heart will flow rivers of living water. Would you love to have that experience? Rivers of living water flowing out where love is abound, where everybody can take off their mask, everybody can shake their hands, everybody can hug and kisses and expresses their love. The way Holy Spirit works begins with our admitting that we need help. We need God's help. John says in the book of John, but this he spoke, this Jesus spoke concerning the Spirit that is coming, whom those believing in Jesus would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given. But Jesus has been given. Jesus has been given to us. This tells me that the goal of the believer is not just to be a contented person, but rather a conduit. Conduit. Not just that we would be blessed with where we are, but that we would be a blessing to someone 
someone, somebody in and around us. If I ask you today, church, do you have a firm faith? Some of us may answer yes to that question. If you can do so, let me ask you this question then. Do you have a flowing faith? Do you have a firm faith? What about a flowing faith? I don't think Jesus wants us to just sort of be content, splashing around in our little pond that we have collected. Wow, I'm going to have a great time here. No, conduit faith, flowing faith means that we are supposed to help others in need. So that they can be refreshed. So that they can be re-energized. In other words, this paraclete, paracletus, this parachute, this helper will come as we help others. For those who haven't listened correctly, let me say that again. This helper, this Holy Spirit comes as we help others. We will be blessed, Jesus says, under this condition. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, encourage the oppressed. Then God will make sure you are always blessed in abundance. God will send the paraclete to you. Interesting, isn't it? What we make happen for others, God will make happen for us. We may not know how to start a meaningful conversation, but can you, can you give somebody a kind word? At the grocery store, you have a large basket, and the person behind you is carrying just a few. Instead of pretending he doesn't exist, can you let her go ahead of you? In the parking lot, you pulled up to the last spot at the same time as another car. Instead of saying, Thank God you helped me beat him to the spot. Can you back up and let him have that spot? God still sends the helper. And when we make happen for others, God will make sure things happen for us. I heard about this man. This man finally went to the doctor and After weeks of strange symptoms, the doctor examined him carefully and then called the wife secretly into the office. He said to the wife, your husband is suffering from a very rare form of anemia, a very rare disease. Without treatment, he will be dead in a few weeks. But the good news is it can be treated with proper nutrition. Here is the condition, he said to the wife. You will need to get up early every morning and fix your husband a hot breakfast, pancakes, bacon, and eggs. He will need a big home-cooked lunch every day and then an old-fashioned meat and potatoes dinners every evening. It is very helpful if you could bake frequently cakes and pies Homemade bread, these are the things that will allow your husband to live a symptom-free life. One more thing, his immune system is so weak, so it is important that you, your home be kept spotless at all times. Do you want to break the news, or shall I, ask the doctor? The wife said, I will. She walked into the room, into the waiting room, the husband sensing the seriousness Asked her, tell me, what is it? With a sob, the wife blurted out, the doctor says, you are going to die. Anyone can return evil for evil. The Bible challenges us. However, when we make people, when we make their day, God will make sure God will make our day. Love overlooks a person's faults, believing the best in every person. I said every person. 
The Bible records this Holy Spirit is available. This parachute is available for everyone. There's no exception. Everyone. God still sent the paraclete, the paracletus, this parachute. And you know what? When God sent this helper, God uses you and me. God uses people like us. May we be the parachute. May we be the helper. Amen. Offering prayer. Bountiful God, we come with our offerings in response to your love. With a new life in Christ, we give ourselves in service to others. With the energy bestowed by the Spirit, we seek to inflame all your people with a zeal for your way. Receive the work we do and the gifts we bring. 
that they may become a blessing in your sight. As we join our heart and mind together in the sacrament of the Holy Communion, let us profess our faith together. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer in the language of your choice. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Holy God of wind and fire, your spirit renews the hearts of your people. We thank you for your gifts of Pentecostal power, prophetic words of truth and justice, flames that kindle new visions, fresh breezes that blow down the walls, and your spirit that guides us. You sent us, Jesus, your gift of grace, our light and flame. You poured out your spirit upon us that all might be made whole, and so it is that on this Feast of Pentecost, we give you praise and thanks for your many gifts. Let us remember together our Lord Jesus at the table. On the night before he died, Jesus had supper with his companions. We also proclaim the holy determination of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take it, do this in remembrance of me. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he passed it amongst them, saying, Drink this. Do this in remembrance of me. And this Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, I will ask my Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. Amen. Body of Christ, the new covenant shed in Jesus' blood.
Let us continue to pray. Eternal and gracious one, though we live in a world of need, here we have tasted your goodness and hungered for a world more just. Though daily we touch our limits, here we have received the fullness of your grace. Send us forth, O God, in faith, in hope, and in love. Amen. On the day of Pentecost, the disciples experienced the Holy Spirit, that paraclete, that helper. Today is our Pentecost. Every day is our Pentecost. God still sends the Holy Spirit. May the grace of Lord Jesus Christ, love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.